real quick, we're going to start with some announcements. Okay, we're opening up the church more and we're moving towards doing things the way we used to. On Sundays, we're going to be moving back to an 11 a.m. combined service. We're also not going to be having these uh, red stop signs um, anymore in the seats starting next week. Okay. Uh, also, just a reminder that today is also Mission Sunday. So uh, any uh, giving that you give, this will go to supporting our, our missions, um, which we have a box in the back. and. Uh, or we do have online giving as well, which you can get on the church web, which you can do on the church website. So, let's rise up together and start our time of worship. on all that you've done, all that you're doing, all that you continue to do, all that you've accomplished in your victory through, through your works, through your spirit, and through your son. Amen. Amen. Amen.
I just come before you and I, I ask for help right now, Lord. God, I, I just pray, Lord, that uh, your spirit be upon this place and upon us. Give us a calmness of spirit, Lord, that relies on you. Lord, calm my mind and my heart. God, that as I give your word and I give your gospel, Lord, that it will ring true. Because it is true. And it is life. God, help us, Lord, this day to honor you first and foremost. God, we love you, we praise you, we thank you. Amen. Amen. As you can imagine, uh, life has many, many challenges in it. Um, you know, one of the fun things we've had happen this last week is, you know, we actually have the bathrooms over there in the corner renovated. You know, they're almost done, just a little bit more touch-up paint here and there, but, you know, it's looking really nice. Really appreciate all the work that uh, JT Delaney and uh, his co-worker Isaac and, and Jenna did in, in working on those restrooms. Um, but as we knew, there's always challenges that arise that you don't always uh, expect. And sometimes they're smaller ones, sometimes they're larger ones. Sometimes they feel larger than, than life. You know, and in the last few weeks, we've been talking about God's victory over challenges, over many different kinds. 
We've seen God cast away fear. We've seen Him deliver His promises time and time again. We've seen Him cast away doubt and all doubt. That we can trust that our God remains faithful to us at all times. In David and Goliath, we saw that David's courage was a byproduct of his faith. And while fear will try to put us in a place of hopelessness, faith will not. And as we learned from Moses, if we value God above the treasure of this life, should we also then also treasure God's plans in the unseen, the things that He has in store for us that we don't? And if we treasure God more than air itself, then we need to then stop holding on to the temporal things of this world and hold more to the promises of God, trusting in His plan for our lives. You know, we look at David and Goliath, we see Moses and Pharaoh, and we would look at this as a typical protagonist-antagonist situation. You got the good guy, you got the bad guy. And then, in many times, like in movies or even video games, you'll, you'll see there's always the, the overarching villain. Someone that is greater and, and stronger than all the other bad guys. And a lot of times, uh, the younger people might, might understand this a little more. We usually call it the, ba the boss, not the bass. Oh, let's go fishing. Uh, we usually call it the boss bad guy. Because for some reason, the challenges associated with the boss are greater and stronger than anything you've had to face beforehand. There's, and, and so where, where I am going with this is this. In these previous stories, we've talked about Goliath. We've, we've talked about Pharaoh and, and their defeats in the Old Testament. But today we're going to be talking about really a physical enemy that we all have in common, something that uh, we all don't necessarily like to think about, and that's death. You know, if you, if you look up in the dictionary, a definition for death, you know, it's, it's kind of a cold definition. It says, it says this, it says, it is the action or the fact of dying or being killed, the end of the life of a person or organism. But as believers of God and believers of His Word, we have a unique perspective of death. And the only reason why it's unique is because it's not common to this world. But we know that it is true because we know that God understands best what is death. Death is the result of sin. And when we consider that death is actually a punishment for sin, if we look a little bit closer at what death is, death, it is God's justice being exercised on His creation. Death is a form of God's justice being exercised on creation. We sinned. The punishment for our sin is God exercising His right to judge sin. And that is administered through the tool of death. And we're surrounded by death of all kinds. We see death which is quick and painless. We see death which is done by a thousand cuts. There's always death at the end of our lives, but many times different parts of us start to die first. It might be our sight. It might be our hearing. It might be our skin. It might be our mind. Yet... Death comes. We live in a fallen world where sin abounds. And naturally because sin abounds, then yes, then death must exist in a world where sin exists. This sin and death it is an outcome shared by all of us. For all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. And so this is something that, yes, every single human on this planet has to deal with. 
Aren't you glad you came to church today? <laughs> but our God is a God of hope. Our God is a God of life. Our God is a God that sets his good plans into motion. And God, in his perfect plan, knew the only way for his justice to be perfectly executed and to save his creation so that we would no longer need to worry or fear about death was through his son, Jesus Christ, that we might thrive in who God is and in our relationship with him. We serve a good, good God for what he has done. Now I'd like you to turn with me to Mark 10, 32 through 34. And the reason why I selected this text is because as you're going to see, Jesus knows what he's getting into. Jesus was not caught off guard by his betrayal nor by the pain and the torture of his death. He knew what would happen. And as sad as that is for Jesus Christ, it also needs to serve as a comfort to us to know Jesus' obedience to the Father, but also he knew exactly what he was doing when he died on the cross. So Mark 10, 32 through 34. And when, and when they were on the road, going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, Jesus began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him, and spit on him, and flog him, and kill him, and after three days, he will rise. And all the religions, and all the religious leaders that exist in the world, Jesus Christ is the only one that is able to predict both his death and his resurrection. In fact, Christ is even detailed, listen, he's even detailed in understanding his death and how it's going to come about. Detailed enough to say that the, the chief priests and the scribes would actually use a loophole, would try to use a loophole in their law to get Jesus crucified. After all, in Jewish tradition, it was not permitted that executions like this would happen. No, it was only permitted in Roman Gentile culture. And Jesus straightforward said, I will, by, by, the, by the chiefs and the scribes, I will be handed over to the Gentiles. And actually, this is also the third time in Scripture where we see Jesus speak of his death that is on the way. So the fact that Jesus knows this so well, and that his death is coming so well, should remind us that similar to how God had a plan for Moses and for David in their victories over their enemies, God had a plan for Jesus to conquer death and sin. And Jesus walked into it knowing fully that he himself would have to die. Again, I know one of the, the temptations when it comes to talking about death is to uh, sit and think about it too long, you know. But I wonder what it must have been like for Jesus Christ to know that it was coming. If you and I knew the exact day that we were going to die, and we had an idea of the method that that death was coming, that would just almost like curse every single day leading up to that point. It makes it so the fact that we don't know the day that we return to heaven actually makes it really a blessing is the way I see that. And here we have Jesus Christ, fully human, knowing, uh, fully human and fully God, knowing that he will experience death. And it weighed very deeply on his heart 
that he was going to experience such a death. You see him, even cry tears of blood, that it weighs so deeply on his heart. He knew it was coming. He can see all of these things coming towards him. He knows about the treachery. He knows about the hypocrisy. He knows about the mockery and the pain and the torture and the spitting and people calling out insults to him. He knows it is coming. Yet, what do we see Christ do? In knowing that all of this is coming, what does he do? He doesn't retreat. And he doesn't stand still. But with unflinching determination, unflinching faithfulness to the Father, he walks right into it. He allows it to happen. Because he knows it is necessary. He knows he's doing it out of obedience to the Father, and he knows that it is necessary for our salvation. So we see Jesus' betrayal and his death carried out. And I want to take some time. I'm going to read for you the account from Mark 15, verses 12 through 38. And as I read through it, I want you to remember something. Jesus knew this was going to happen. And he did this for us. So Mark 15, 12 through 38. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked the chief priests. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him! Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. And he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is, the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again, they struck him on the head with a staff and spat on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. <laughs> he saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let, let this Messiah, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross, <laughs> that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults upon him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sebachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone, and let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. And with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. 
And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. If we looked at this story as a battle, and Jesus is going into a battle against death, we would be tempted to say that death, and therefore the sin which leads to death, wins. Christ is in agony, breathes his last breath, and as our dictionary definition said, Death is the action or the fact of dying or being killed. The end of life of a person or an organism. And that seems to be entirely the case here. Christ did die. And that's important for us to realize. Christ did indeed die. He physically die. But why? Why did Jesus have to die? I'll admit on that one question alone I could probably do a sermon or even a series because there is so much that the death of Christ actually does for us. In terms of its redemption, in terms of the re in the restoration of our relationship, in terms of the atonement and the spilling of blood, there's so much that it does. But I'm only going to be covering two things with you today regarding why did Jesus have to die. Well, first, why did he have to die? First, to demonstrate the kind of love that Jesus has for us. The death of Christ is a demonstration of God's love. And it is also the supreme expression of God's own love for those that trust in, in it. The sufferings and the death of Christ have to do with you and me personally. It's my sin that cuts me off from God. And because of my sin, I am lost. I am perishing. My body is dying. I was out playing soccer with Elijah yesterday, and I can tell you, my, my left knee doesn't work quite the way it used to when I first damaged it in college. And the right one's not far behind because that one got injured too about 10 years ago. My body is failing me right now, and it's going to continue to fail me until all of it fails. And then all that is left, all that is left for me then is for me to, to plead to God, to come to God, plead for mercy, plead for His Son. It's my sin which has caused this condition. And then I see Christ suffering and dying, and we have to ask ourselves, for whom did He die? Ephesians 5.25 says, Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her. And John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, that someone would lay down his life for his friends. Matthew 20, 28 says, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So you might ask yourself, Can this be for me too then? Does Christ really love me? Well, to summarize, simply I would say, yes, Christ does love you. His death was meant to save you from your sin as well. And Scripture confirms it, John 1, 12, To all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. And my hope is that as you hear about the type of love, the kind of love that Jesus Christ has for you, I pray that that moves you. I pray that it sways your heart. And maybe if you have not made that commitment in your heart, well, maybe now will be that time where you make that commitment. Christ loves you. 
Christ died for you. Trust in what he has done in his death, and as we'll talk about in a second, his resurrection. So the first thing he had done, why did he have to die? It was to demonstrate his love for us. The second reason that I'm bringing up is to achieve his own resurrection from the dead. He had to die so he could be truly resurrected. Christ could not experience a physical resurrection if he did not physically completely die. This is important theologically. Because there are those that would say that maybe his death wasn't completely physical. Maybe it was only spiritual. Or they would say his resurrection was not physical and it was only spiritual. The only problem with that type of thinking and that type of theology is it doesn't work. Because the wrath of God was upon us, humans, people. And the wrath of God had to be exercised on someone that was completely human. And Christ was completely human. He was completely God as well. I know we don't quite understand how that works. Well, that's just who God is. But he was. He was completely human. And he was completely God. So he had to die completely physically. And he had to be resurrected completely physically to achieve what it needed to do that we might have life. The death of Christ did not merely precede his resurrection. It was the toll to get to the resurrection. The Bible says he was raised not after the blood shedding, but by his shedding of blood. The justice of God was satisfied in the suffering and the death of Jesus. And the price for forgiveness was totally paid. The righteousness of God was completely vindicated. All that was left to accomplish, all that God had left to do at this point, was to announce Jesus Christ. To show the completed work that it had done what it had done. And so yes, the resurrection and the ascension to the right hand of God the Father. When the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And you are still in your sins. The point of the resurrection. The point is not that the resurrection is the price paid for our sins. The point is that the resurrection proves that the death of Jesus is an all-sufficient price. Because you see, if anybody died in an attempt to forgive us all of our sins, and they had sin in their life, they would remain dead. But Christ who was blameless and perfect in his death, defeated sin and defeated death, and so he rose again. So we, ask, so we have asked the question, why did Jesus have to die? Here's another question. Why did Jesus rise from the dead? Romans 6, 3 through 4 says this, Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in a newness of life. I'll say one of the more uh, helpful studies I ever had is I, I actually studied... Uh, the concept of baptism in Roman culture a long time ago blew my mind. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was one of those uh, studies that just really uh, enriched, it, it, it enriched my studies of Scripture. And in Roman culture, baptism was a testament to uniting yourself with a family or marking your allegiance and trust with a particular group of people. And this is why when we baptize, it is out of an outward declaration to our commitment and our unity with Christ. So in being united with Christ, we still die as Christ died. Therefore, we still experience a physical death. 
and our sins die with Him. And that is because we also wait for God to redeem His creation. So yes, death remains a bit longer, but just as we share in death with Christ, well, now we share in something else with Him as well, and we share in His resurrection. By this unity and by this relationship with Him, we share in this resurrected state with Him. Now, unless Christ returns, we each share the same fate and will one day physically die. But to those of us that believe, to those that trust in the victory of Jesus Christ, we have a continuous hope that we can rely upon, that we will be with our Father in heaven. Jesus is the Son of God. And as the Son of God, He said He would not remain dead, and He would indeed rise from the dead three days later. So just as we share in the same death as Christ, we will share the same destination through His resurrection in heaven. The death of Christ was the death meant for us because of our sin. So we could be united with God once again. And the resurrection of Christ is the path to heaven Christ established in His glory at the right hand of God. Christ, straightforward, defeated death for you. I know I call many of you my brothers and sisters in Christ, but I've also made it a policy to always preach the gospel as if you've never heard it before. Because you might find yourself today challenged by this truth that Jesus Christ did indeed live. Christ did indeed die. He was absolutely resurrected on the third day, and He absolutely ascended into heaven. And that when you trust in what Christ did in His death and His resurrection and all that He is, and you confess your sins and you put those at the cross, you put those with Christ, if you trust in Him as your Lord and Savior in this way, you will have everlasting life. Christ willingly walked into this because He loved you and that you might have life and life in abundance. So if you have not trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior today, I would say start now. And if you want to and you're not really sure how to do it, come meet with me after service. And, and I'll help you through it. I would love to do that with you. Let's give this to our Heavenly Father. Whose greatest victory over death surpasses all other victories that we can imagine. And we should find ourselves thankful and also willing to share that good news wherever God sends us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for this morning, this time together. I thank you for this church family, Lord. God, that, uh, Lord, we know we're not perfect. God, that we mess things up. But God, we also give ourselves to you. We give our screw-ups to you. We give our sin to you. Because, Lord, if we stand by it, we'll be defeated. But in you, Lord, there's victory. God, I ask right now that you'll just work in our hearts. Continue to work on us that we might glorify you more. And, Lord, if we do not know you, God, I pray that we, that we give our heart and soul to you, Lord. That we trust you with our lives. That we trust you with our sin, God. Because you already took so much more upon yourself. Thank you, Lord, for sending your Son on the cross for our sins. God, that we might have some lasting victory in this life over death. Amen.
you would please rise as we close in singing I Love. Remember the victory which Christ has won for you. It is not one, one with muscle. It is not one, one with your education or your bloodline. But it was won on the blood of Christ in His Spirit. So go in peace and the courage knowing that God is with you.